looks like we got quite a few people on. Um, why don't we go ahead and get started? We've got some really good cases for you guys this morning. Hopefully, uh, everybody's had a good chance to take a look at them. So, uh, anybody want to start off with this one? Hey, Dr. Cockrell. Uh, good morning. This is Usman from Baylor. I can go ahead and get started. Okay, great. So, um, it looks like we have a punch here. Um, from this power, I would favor more of an inflammatory process. Um, most of the action seems to be concentrated in the subcutaneous area. Um, I, besides some perivascular inflammation and maybe some solar elastosis at the top, I don't see too much of, uh, of, uh, maybe, um, you know, worth. Um, and then when we go down into the subcutaneous area, so I see like admixed with all the fat cells, there's, um, Kind of some kind of a mixed or some some sort of uh, inflammatory infiltrate going on. Um, I also see some extravasated red blood cells and some kind of focal basophilic areas as well. Um, so you would then, classify this as what general category of inflammatory skin disease? Uh, I would say a paniculitis of some sort. Good, excellent. So paniculitis, there's a nice sort of logical fact intensive way of, of going through paniculitis. So what's the uh, sort of the pattern analysis, if you will, when you're looking at paniculitis at low magnification? So you look for either uh, septal versus lobular. Yeah, good, that's the starting point. So of those two, which would you really favor here? I would favor a lobular good. Um, type good. here. Yeah, and one thing about, just a caveat about that, just like everything, and the mother nature and you know dermatopathology no, no exception they're all always exceptions to the rule so you can get mostly septal with a little periseptal lobular inflammation for example like an erythema nodosum we always talk about that being a septal paniculitis but it's very common to get a little bit of periseptal uh, lobular inflammation so don't uh, just assume that if you're seeing a slide of, of uh, erythema nodosum and it's got a little bit of lobular change to, this, to the edge of those markedly thickened septa where there's inflammation, that it can't be that. So uh, make sure you're, you're flexible enough in your thinking to realize that there can be some, some overlap. But when you see something like this, this is wiping out virtually the entire lobule. The septum is not thickened or anything. It just looks like there's a diffuse process involving the entire uh, lobule. So I agree with you. This would be a nice example of a lobular paniculitis. Here's another piece that's uh, probably, they may, they may have taken a, a punch and then maybe did a telescoping punch or something and they got a second chunk in here. Mm -hmm. So uh, so good. So lobular. And then what's the next thing that you do when you're looking at, uh, when you've decided it's lobular, what's the, sort of the next step? Well, um, I suppose you could look for uh, the specific cells that are comprising the infiltrate and kind of see what they're 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 comprised of. Well, yeah, I that's that's the next. That is a an a next one of the next steps that you do. The the other thing that we often do is just recommend looking and see if there's any vasculitis. So, for example, if you get a lobular mostly paniculitis, and it's got vasculitis, then you say, hey, you know, that puts it into a very small category of entities like you know, nodular vasculitis, erythema endurotum, uh, migratory thrombophlebitis, uh, you know, things of that nature. And then you look to, or, or you know, subcutaneous polyarteritis or dose, you look to see then uh, how much of the septa of the lobules are, are sort of damaged. Uh, so in other words, if you get nodular vasculitis, you'll see the larger vessel with a lot of suppuration and then granulomatous inflammation involving the lobules. If you get subcutaneous polyarteritis nodosa or migratory thrombophlebitis, those actually can be lobular, I mean, I'm sorry, septal paniculitis, actually, because they may be in the septa, uh, and they may not actually have much lobular inflammation, surprisingly enough. So, so look for vasculitis next, and then you look for the type of inflammation, which you're exactly right. And what kind of cells did you see here? Well, <clears throat> uh, when I looked, I saw some lymphocytes and some foamy histiocytes. Um, and... What about I thought right? I may have seen a couple of neutroph neutrophils too, perhaps. Yeah, good. So it's kind of a mixed infiltrate, but there are a lot of neutrophils. What cells were not present here? Um, I didn't see plasma cells. Um, yeah, if there were, there weren't very many. And, and eosinophil, uh, eosinophils good. either. Definitely not eosinophils. And that's kind of helpful because 
there are paniculitides, even erythema nodosum, you can sometimes get some eosinophils in that. Um, let's say you have something like uh, uh, subcutaneous morphia that can give you eosinophils, or if you had something even like maybe a very deep arthropod assault reaction that could give you uh, some eosinophils. So those are, you definitely don't see eosinophils here. And let's look at the other. And then you look to see if there's anything else, any other findings here that might help you with the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we saw these, which, um, so these, these, I think these kind of look like the ghost cells, um, which are like the, the, you know, the fat cells that have kind of gotten necrosed over. Um, that was my thought when I looked at those. Um, so I, fat cells can become necrotic in a lot of different ways, right? They can, let me say, for example, in lupus erythematosus profundus, they get degenerated there and it kind of, uh, they, they get sort of fibrin comes in and, and you get this kind of pink hyaline fibrinoid like uh, replacement of the subcutis. So that's, that's one form of fat necrosis. Um, you get traumatic fat necrosis where you just get a lot of suppuration in there and and then the, you get a lot of foamy macrophages. So if somebody gets hit with a, a baseball or something like that and you biopsy it, 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 it looks like that. But what about here? What are we looking at in this specific field right here? This is a form of fat necrosis. You're absolutely correct. But it's got a special morphology to it that's, that's pathognomonic, basically. Mm -hmm. Would these be those um, kind of calcium salt deposits that are you know, present? Um, like in the fat salts themselves, or yeah. Uh, so what what clients? are what are the salt deposits that you're talking about specifically? So it's um, it's it's like saponification. Um, yes, yes, yeah. exactly. It is saponification, which is a uh, I think it's uh, calcium stearate. Maybe uh, it's the 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 lipids. You know the. Uh, the acids and whatnot, when they get broken down because of the pancreatic enzymes that kind of come in there. And then the body forms these calcium salts. You're exactly right. That's exactly what this is. And this, this basically what's happening is that the human body is forming soap in its own normal skin tissue. And then that actually, you can imagine if you injected a little bit of soap in your skin, that would cause a lot of inflammation and you get the secondary neutrophilic infiltrate, sometimes some histiocytes. Uh, and so it's really almost a foreign body reaction. And it's related to the uh, amylase and lipase that gets released when somebody has uh, a pancreatic disorder. So we call this pancreatic paniculitis. So it's pathognomonic, really, when you see this. So it's good. So this, I want to make sure you guys recognize this, because this, this is the classic pattern of these little, uh, they're, they're almost like the type of cells that you see in a in a plant in a way, because you, they, these almost form these firm little cell walls here, they get calcified and, and it's almost analogous to forming a, a uh, you know, with the xylem and phloem inside of, of a you know, piece of stalk of celery or something like that. So think of it as that, as that way. And it almost looks like a little um, checkerboard. You have these little squares here. So, and it's calcified, it's got this granular bluish gray material that's that's pathognomonic for calcification so this is saponification if somebody gets this um they're going to have a pancreatic disorder uh somewhere and we we had a case uh, a few years ago of someone that um had a, a tiny little pancreatic fistula uh to their gallbladder and uh <laughs> had just a transient elevation of their pancreatic enzymes and uh, we saw it on the biopsy and, and they, they just said, well, this person doesn't have pancreatic disease and they, they sort of fought with us and eventually they found it. So if you see this, you're right and, and anybody that says it isn't there is wrong. So just make sure you, you can recognize this. This is a, a beautiful, this is, if I were writing a board uh, exam, I would put this on there because it's so, uh, it's, a, it's something that you can recognize. It's, it's like molluscum bodies, you know, you can recognize those and they're pathognomonic. So if you see this, is pathognomonic. Now, there's only one other thing that, so, so think of this not as really a classic inflammatory paniculitis. It's more like a, uh, almost like a, a metabolic process that causes a foreign body. And there's one other entity that's in the differential diagnosis that has that same pathophysiology. It doesn't give you the saponification, but it can give you a dense suppurative paniculitis. Anybody know what that 
disease is? The old read my mind kind of question. And you may not know it, but you should at least think about it. Um, it's alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency paniculitis. And that's also a, an enzyme. So, you know, if you have, if you don't have your uh, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin enzyme there, the trypsin is overexpressed. And it, instead of uh, causing saponification and then this foreign body reaction, it's almost like scissors that goes in and it just kind of dissects away the individual uh, uh, septa, if you will, the, the cells around the lipocytes, and then they kind of become floating freely in the, uh, in the fat, if you see it in an early stage. And then because that lipid gets released from those lipocytes, then you get a, a marked inflammatory reaction. So it's almost analogous to uh, traumatic fat necrosis, but it's a metabolic process and you get massive amounts of neutrophils. And because that goes on throughout the entire body, they get lung disease, they, you know, they die, it's a, it's a horrible disease, but they also get a paniculitis. And it's a secondary metabolic paniculitis. So it's not really a truly primary inflammatory paniculitis like erythematodosum or uh, you know, some of those diseases. It's more like a metabolic process. You just realize when your fat gets damaged, it can kind of almost uh, function as a, as a foreign body. All right, here's another one that's just, uh, you may as well be prepared for getting this on the exam too, because it's, this is just a beautiful example of this. And it's got lots of educational points in the slide that um, are helpful to you in making the diagnosis. So who wants to give this one a go? I can. Good morning, Dr. Cockrell. It's Leah from Baylor. So here we have a punch and already we're seeing this very prominent follicular plugging. Um, but just to go down your um, system, this looks like an inflammatory process. And from this power, I can already see some inflammation at the interface and perhaps around some of the blood vessels. So I would call it a, like the superficial perivascular dermatitis with interface change. Yeah, it might even be a little bit, this is pretty deep. You know, here's, here's most of the superficial plexuses up here. Mm -hmm. And these follicles extend pretty uh, far down, probably because this is from the scalp, actually. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this side over here, you know, you've got these follicles that are, they're, they're obviously not normal. I mean, this, this would be, if it's on the scalp, this person, what do you think that scalp's going to look like? <laughs> not very good. Yeah, they're not going to have any hair. It's going to be an alopecia <laughs> for sure. And so you've got, you know, three or four follicles here. They've been shifted into telogen. There's inflammation at the sites where the follicles are. And then, and then all this massive follicular plugging. And what kind of cells do you see here? So they look like lymphocytes. Yeah, um, this power, um, these are jet black. I mean, these got to be lymphocytes. So you probably know the diagnosis here. And uh, this is a list of, and what else do you see besides, there's, there is some interface change here. There's some bacterial alteration. What else do you see at the, at the junction here? Yes, so I see some very prominent epidermal thinning. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, you're right. I was just confirming that. Yeah. Um, and then it looks like there is, I don't know, in this upper dermis, it looks like, I'm not quite sure what that is, if that's edema or if that's um, like all this pale pink. Yeah, I think there is some, there is some edema here. And actually mm -hmm. we see that in this entity sometimes. Um, you see there's some smudging of the basal membrane zone here, and there may be some thickening over here. And then some of this is solar elastosis. But if you go down here, I think some of this is not solar elastosis, you know, this deep. I think some of this stuff is almost certainly going to be mucin here. Mm -hmm. but you don't really need to do a special stain for that. If you, you can tell the difference. If you look up here, um, they're fibers. If you look down here, it's kind of a granular bluish gray material between the fibroblast here. So mm -hmm. there's mucin here also. So mm -hmm. this just shows every, you know what the diagnosis is, right? Yes, DLE. Yeah, this is classic discoid LE. And it shows every feature of it. That, that's, that's the beauty of showing this, mm -hmm. this slide because it's got the thinning in the epidermis, got the follicular plugging. Um, it is from the scalp. And you can see that it's an alopecia. Normally, you'd have about eight to 10 follicles rooted down here in the subcutaneous fat. Here we have none. So you know mm -hmm. it's an alopecia. And uh, it's got the change in the epidermis. So this is a, an example of chronic 
discoid lupus has been present for a, a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, now they might, if you're going to write a board examination and you want to kind of trip up your, your colleagues, I always like to sort of do that little mental <laughs> exercise. What are a few things you might throw in the differential to try to screw them up? Because what are you going to focus on when you look at this slide at low power? Certainly the follicular plugging. And so yeah. I would put other entities on that differential. Um, yeah. I would hope if you're trying to throw them kind of like a softball, maybe just KP. <laughs> but if, <laughs> if you're trying to do a little bit something more um, inflammatory, maybe you would do um, PRP or fibrosis. Um, those would be things that I would write <laughs> on my oh, question. Oh, well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last one you said. LS. Yeah, lichen sclerosis. Yeah, that can sometimes give you follicular plugging. Uh, you might even throw in their vitamin A deficiency, phrenoderma. You know, they can get mm -hmm. follicular plugging with that. Uh, I think barriers disease can also do follicular plugging. Yeah, good, good. So that's 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 a good thing to just be able to work through the differential diagnosis of that. And and that those would probably be some things they might throw in there as confounding uh, choices. But you guys would never fall for that because it's got all the classic features of, of discoid LE in this setting. Um, now they might, I, this would be a lot, a little bit more um, diabolical if they also put in their subacute LE or acute LE, mm -hmm. um, you, you shouldn't choose those either because generally by the time, you know, subacute LE doesn't give you follicular plugging and it can give you the thinning in the epidermis, but it really looks more uh, like acute lupus erythematosus. It's more of a mm -hmm. interface dermatitis and vacuolar alteration. You may or may not get any deeper inflammation in there. So um, they probably wouldn't expect you to distinguish between the various forms of lupus, uh, but they might. So just make sure you recognize when you get this pattern, it really looks great for discoid LE. Okay. Good. Everybody got that one without any problem, I take it? All right, let's give this one a go. All right, um, this is Christina from Baylor. I can do this one. Um, so looks like we have um, multiple sections of a punch biopsy here. Um, I'm not positive of the anatomic site. Um, there are a lot of blood vessels, so I thought maybe the leg, but. Good, good. You can exclude uh -huh. some sites, right? <laughs> uh, it's probably uh -huh. not scalp like the last one, doesn't have any hair follicles and. Mm -hmm. It's not palm or sole. So yeah, you, you, you can exclude some sites, probably extremity or trunk, something like that, when it sort of looks like just nondescript skin. And then if you see a lot of blood vessels superficially, yeah, maybe the lower leg. So that's good. Okay. My initial thought or step would, would be to say this isn't more inflammatory. Good. Um, and then in regards to the pattern, um, I mean, there's from this power, there's kind of like a, a band like infiltrate of um, inflammatory cells in the papillary dermis. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I would agree with that. What kind yeah. of cells do you think these are? And, I, and this, this is a nice slide to contrast with the last one at low power there. Remember how dark and jet black those cells were around those blood vessels? You can mm. see the difference here, right? These yeah, yeah. Don't look the same. So we say, well, we know these are not going to all be lymphocytes. There may be some other cell in there. So you may not know for sure, but you can just say, well, boy, this, this sure isn't a lipstick infiltrate here. So <laughs> it's, gonna, it's a clue at low power that you're going to go to higher magnification. Well, what, what's going on up there? You know, let's, let's take a look mm -hmm. at it. So, for example, we probably wouldn't, you know, we think of band-like infiltrate, some things that can cause that pattern, mycosis fungoides, urticarial pemphigoid. So we say, well, it's probably not going to be MF if it's this dense and there aren't lymphocytes. So we can kind mm -hmm. of rule that out even at low power. But let's go to higher magnification, see what kind of cells we are looking at here. And now what do you see? So um, I think neutrophils yes. is probably what I'm seeing yes. here. And yes. some of look a little bit like broken up. <laughs> um, yeah, like a lot of them are broken up. Good. And then I'm also seeing, I would say now like on higher power, maybe there's, I would say there's a little bit more like maybe paravascular prominence. I don't yeah, know. I would agree with that. Okay. Um, and then I also kind of noticed some of, there's like a lot of extra extravasated red blood cells. Okay. And then it also looks like there's maybe some fibrin around the blood vessels as well. I, so what's the diagnosis here? 
Um, I think this is um, LCCV or small vessel vasculitis. Good. Exactly right. This is leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Absolutely. And uh, he, it's sometimes it can be, when you get this much inflammation here, it can be a little bit difficult to tell the fibrin. I agree that there is fibrin in this blood vessel up here. And mm -hmm. notice the size of the blood vessels. You're, you're right. You said it's a small blood vessel uh, vasculitis. So these are probably arterioles and venules that are involved mm -hmm. here. Um, and so, yeah, a fully developed lesion of, of leukocytoclastic vasculitis looks exactly like this. You see the the neutrophils, the leukocytoclasia, uh, the fibrin in the blood vessel walls. If you get it early, you may not see the fibrin. You may just see some leukocytoclasia when you get it early. Now, mm -hmm. the next question, so if we want to make it a little harder, we might ask what are some of the potential causes of this type of leukocytoclastic vasculitis here? What's um, probably the most common cause that we, we get biopsies of, especially in young individuals? Let's see here. I mean, I think um, in like infection or like inflammatory diseases can be associated. I think a lot of the times we're not sure of the cause. Yeah, it is a reaction pattern. You're, you're right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, if you get a ton of neutrophils like you see here, where it's really almost looks even where you get more neutrophils in this, but it's still leukocytoclastic vasculitis, it's not septic vasculitis. Um, mm -hmm. What's the most common vasculitis that gives you an abundant neutrophils would almost give you like pustules clinically. Oh, IgA vasculitis? Yes, good. IgA, HSP, um, you know, acute hemorrhagic edema in childhood, you know, th those are neutrophil mm -hmm. rich. And then the IgA, as you know, is a chemotactin for neutrophils primarily. So it kind of makes pathophysiologic sense that if it's going to be IgA mediated, it's going to, you know, really bring in all these polys. Um, if you see you know, say vasculitis related to lupus, um, you may not see quite as much of the neutrophilic infiltrate. It's, I, you know, I wouldn't, you know, you don't want to, you know, bet the farm on the fact that it's going to be uh, IgA vasculitis if it were to look like this, but it's just, if you're going to sort of want to lay odds, you sort of say, I would, I would favor that. Um, but yeah, it is a reaction pattern and, and it can be seen in a lot of different conditions. So-called microscopic polyangiitis, you know, we used to call that Wegener's in the old days. Um, there's the small vessel form of that can look just like this. Um, it could be related to an infection. You know, a lot of people get, you know, there's, there's vasculitis could be associated with syphilis and, and all sorts of other conditions. Um, a lot of times those vasculitides like associated with uh, mycobacteria will give you a deeper vasculitis, like so-called nodular vasculitis. We talked about with paniculitis a minute ago. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, the, some of the infectious vasculitides tend to give you that pattern. So this one, you know, probably we would say, well, this might be IgA vasculitis, be a lot of things. Sometimes we get internists that uh, we, we diagnose it as LCV and they then call and say, what's the cause of it? And we say, well, I'm sorry, that's gonna be something you're gonna have to work up and figure it out. <laughs> Um, what's one test that you could do that might help, uh, that might sort of get it into the IgA vasculitis category? I mean, could you do a DIS and see like what immunoglobulin is there? Yeah. If you get IgA deposited, that's very helpful. Um, mm -hmm. we often will see cases of bona fide IgA vasculitis that are biopsy generally after 24 hours and it can be negative. So if you don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not IgA vasculitis, but if you do see it and that's it, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the biopsies of vasculitis for direct immunofluorescence, um, mixed bag, mm -hmm. a lot of times we, we see it's obvious vasculitis like this with the immuno and it's, it's weak or it's negative. So, you know, if, if, it's, if it's positive, it's helpful. If it's, if it's not positive, that doesn't really rule mm -hmm. it out. So this is just one I want to make sure you guys can recognize. You're almost certain to get this on an exam. And mm -hmm. uh, they probably would maybe ask you a second order question. They might expect you to get this pretty quickly. Um, now, just a couple of things, a couple of teaching points of, about this. Uh, what's the way to tell this, say, from septic vasculitis? Let's say you got a 25-year-old woman that comes in with joint pains and you know, she's got a vaginal discharge and she's got pustules over her knuckles and then you biopsy it. What's that going to look like uh, under the microscope as opposed to this? Is it going to look exactly like this or is it going to look a little bit different than this?
And that's a harder question. You kind of have to, to know that, but this, this is something you sort of, I want you to, at least in the, in your brain, I want you to sort of, as you build your encyclopedia of dramatic pathology in your brain, at least have a mental image of what a biopsy of a septic vasculitis process like meningococcemia or gonococcemia would look like versus this, because there is a difference. You can't tell the difference. Does anybody know what that, what that would most likely look like as opposed to what we're looking at right here? Well, if you don't know, that's okay. No, not knowing the answer is a, is a good uh, response. Basically, when you get septic vasculitis, so it's, 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 again, algorithmic. You get thrombosis of the blood vessels with intact neutrophils, very little leukocytoclasia. And that makes sense, right? Because this is an immune complex mediated process. So the neutrophils are breaking down because they're complement going on and all this kind of stuff. When you get bacteria that come in and recruit neutrophils to kill the bacteria, they're not, there's not an immune complex mediated process going on there. So the blood, the bacteria come into the blood vessels, they cause thrombosis of the blood vessels with prominent inflammation. So if you see lots of thrombosis, lots of inflammation, usually like in gonococcemia and meningococcemia, because those are gram uh, negative uh, cocci, they also tend to induce uh, a neutrophilic infiltrate. So you get lots of polys there with relatively few breakdown products of the neutrophils. So that's a way to help distinguish between septic vasculitis, SBE, gonococcemia, meningococcemia, pseudomonas, thymogangrenosum, systemic form. Those generally tend to give you more intact inflammatory cells than leukocytoclasia. Now, if you get thrombotic vasculopathy, Somebody's got, say, you know, a problem with factor V Leiden deficiency or something along those lines. They get lots of bland fibrin thrombi within the blood vessels, usually with relatively minimal inflammation. So that's a vasculopathy. That's, a, that's also vascular injury, but you're getting lots of thrombosis with relatively minimal amount of inflammation. If you do a biopsy, somebody's got lividovasculitis or atrophy blanche, You'll see the markedly thickened blood vessels, the stasis altered blood vessels with the abundant fibrin. Again, that's an, ab, that's an abnormal fibrinolytic pathway because of ischemia. And there you can get some neutrophils, rarely some leukocytoclasia because there's some fibrin going on there, but not to the degree that you see here. So there is a difference that you can think about when you're just looking at the morphology, which of those it's most likely to be. Uh, so just remember that. So leukocytoclasia goes along with immune complexes, Intact neutrophils, thrombi, goes along with bacterial infection usually, uh, sometimes with fungal infections. And then if you actually get a lymphocytic vasculitis, we get lots of inflammation of the endothelial cells with a lot of, uh, actually with lymphocytes, that's a pretty rare pattern. But think of that when you're dealing with rickettsial disorders, things like Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, rickettsial pox, those conditions, the blood vessels are the target of the rickettsia and then the inflammation kind of comes in there secondarily. So it makes sense when you kind of put it together and uh, you can kind of use the morphology to kind of, kind of help you there. Okay, another good example of a- hey, Hello, this is Edgar, uh, another Valor first year. So I think we have some type, multiple sections of some type of excision. Uh, you know, from this power, I think we're probably gonna be doing with, dealing with a, um, um, a follicular type neoplastic process. Good, good. excellent. Uh, uh, I'm starting to see um, a large comodo like stru structure toward the left side of the slide. You see smaller horn cysts. On that more upper slide, we also, I think, seen a lot of sebaceous units as well. Um, from this it's, uh, be benign? Structure. benign or malignant, basically? I, I'm leaning toward benign. Good. And why are you leaning like the leaning tower of Pisa in that direction? <laughs> so uh, it looks to be fairly well circumscribed. You know, I think as, as we get closer, uh, we're going to see more uniform like cells. Um, Good. Relatively small also, you know, maybe this, it might have been a small excision. It could have been maybe a punch excision. I, I think it was probably an excision. And yeah, I agree. It's small, pretty well circumscribed. And sometimes when you get multiple nodular aggregations of it, Look at the individual aggregations and see if they also obey the rules there. 
So let's go to higher magnification now. And you said it's follicular, and I agree with you. Um, there are three parts of the hair follicle. And uh, sometimes these neoplasms can have uh, recapitulate multiple parts, the top, the middle, and the lower part. Which part of the follicle do you think is re being recapitulated in this area? So I would think probably the lower part. I yeah. Think yes. Um, Good. Yeah. It's got these matrical cells. They're, they're the generative cells that are forming the, the hair bulb, if you will, here. That's mm -hmm. like a little papillary mesenchymal body right there. So I totally agree with you. That's the inferior portion. What about this part? You mentioned this at low power. You said there were these comedo-like cysts. So what do you think? Which, which part of the follicle is this differentiating for? So that would be more of the upper portion, I would say. Good. That's the infundibulum. So we've got two different components there. Um, so any idea what this diagnosis might be? So initially, I was thinking, you know, with this large central um, common like structure, and we get these buds from that central structure, I was thinking like a trichofolliculoma. Um, but now that we're seeing, you know, these smaller buds of the lower portion, maybe with some mesenchymal type bodies, maybe it's more of a trico -ep. Yeah, good. And that this is an interesting case because it sort of does have a, uh, uh, a couple of different forms. You're right. I think if you look at that one area that we showed a minute ago, that, that would kind of be more consistent with a trico -epithelium. But I agree if you see something like this, it's kind of looking a little bit like a trichofolliculoma. So this makes the point that sometimes these follicular neoplasms don't read the textbook. Uh, we just, I think we call this most consistent with the trichoep, but I agree it's got, it's, and I think the educational point here is that these things sometimes have different morphologies within them. And uh, you just want, don't want to overcall it as a basal cell or anything like that. So it's pretty straightforward benign and nexal neoplasm with follicular differentiation. It does have some sebaceous uh, component over here that may just be some background sebaceous cells in the lesion. And uh, I think this came from, it certainly was from the head and neck area. I think about it kind of came from the nose actually in this case. So good, that's, that's a nice example. And I, I think it does demonstrate uh, some changes of both trichoepithelioma perhaps like in an area like this and maybe a sort of an abortive trichofolliculoma area here. Um, it, it, the probably where a lot of these entities actually really arise from is from the mantle zone. We talk about that stem cell uh, area that's right at the junction between the infundibulum and the lower part of the follicle. So there's an area there that sort of gets overlooked, but that little stem cell area can give rise to all sorts of hamartomas that you can see that, that look like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, now they might show you this, and they might, what, what uh, second order question do you think they might potentially ask about here if they showed you this? Um, they see. love to ask about syndromes. So can you see this entity in a syndromic uh, situation? Um, I guess, could you get like, uh, see it like in Cowden's? Well, you or... get, there, there is a, a you know, familial multiple trichothelium syndrome. And uh, if you haven't seen that in the clinic yet, you will one of these days. It's really impressive. They come in with these, you know, tons of, of papules on their face, their head and neck area, and, and they, they look horrible. And, uh, and so, again, it can be an autosomal dominant transmitted entity. Um, and we've actually tried treating some of these patients with topical uh, serolemus. And they talk about these things being these P10 related tumors that you can try to suppress that. And sometimes it actually works um, in some of these cases. Um, so yeah, remember multiple uh, trichotheliomas can be familial, autosomal dominant. There's a multiple uh, follicular hamartoma syndrome. Uh, there are Cowden's. Of course, that wouldn't give you multiple trichoepitheliomas. That tends to give you more of the uh, trichloma veruca type lesions and, and trichlomomas. So that's a different entity. So make sure you don't confuse those two. Uh, one other teaching point, I guess I didn't point out. When you're looking at the differential diagnosis between a basal cell carcinoma and a trichoepithelioma, you'll very commonly get clefting between the epithelium and the stroma in a basal cell. And the stroma is usually kind of a loose fibromyxoid stroma, whereas that in these follicular neoplasms tends to be more fibrotic like you see here. There's more collagen there. 
And if there's clefts, it's between the individual collagen fibers, like you see right here, as opposed to between the epithelium and the stroma. And so that's, that's kind of important. In a basal cell, that stroma is sort of a neoplastic stroma, if you will. Here, this stroma is part and parcel of the lesion. But there's a couple other syndromes they might throw on there. You know, they might uh, toss on bird hog du bay. So would this be the kind of lesion that you see with a uh, bird hog du bay? Uh, I think with bird hog du bay, um, I don't think you would get specifically these type of trichoepitheliomas. Yeah. I know that you can't get trichoepitheliomas with like, is it like Brooks Spiegler? Uh, Brooks Spiegler, you can see that's often cylindromas. Okay. Uh, sometimes you can get some follicular tumors in that, I think, but uh, that's more of a cylindroma, spiroidoma kind of combination in that situation. But in, in uh, Burhog de Bay, you see fibro folliculomas. And there you see this really thin little tiny strand of a, an abortive follicle surrounded by prominent fibrous stroma. So that's, that's the, the fibrous component is actually more prominent in a fibro folliculoma or perifollicular fibroma or trichodiscoma. Uh, than you see with this. So this has got more epithelium with, with you know, a prominent stroma, not as, as prominent as you would see there. Those are also little tiny little uh, structures as opposed to larger nodular aggregation. So just make sure you know your, your, your syndromes uh, and which tumors are associated with the syndrome. So you're almost certainly going to get some questions about that too. They love to Thank ask you. questions about uh, adnexal tumors. <laughs> Okay, this is Brandy, I'm up. So we have a punch here. And okay. then as far as like inflammatory versus neoplastic, there's not a whole lot to look at. I would lean towards inflammatory if I had to pick one. Okay. And then location, trunk or extremity, I don't really see any hair follicles. Good. So there's not a lot of inflammation here, is there? Mm -mm. So Let's see if we can find any clues to what's going on here when we get something like this. So what's going on up here? So there, there's an epidermal split. It looks like you have some neutrophils or crust. Yeah, what is this here? So this is a, are you a first year? I am. Okay, good. Because this is, this is a, this, you will learn from this, but it's kind of challenging. This is kind of more maybe a second or third year question, but but what do you think we're looking at right here? Is it necrosis? Good, excellent. What's necrotic there? What is, what is necrotic here? Um, the, the keratinocytes of the epidermis. Yeah, this is the entire epidermis here is necrotic and it is sloughed off and you've got neutrophils beneath it. You've actually got a basket weave cornified layer. So it probably happened pretty quickly. Okay, and when we see a dead epidermis plus inflammation, what do we call that structure? And that's maybe third year answer. But if you know it, um, uh, I would just call it like necrosis or like an ulcer. Yeah, it's actually, it's got a name for it. It's called an eschar. Okay. So have you ever seen somebody that's, that's like been a burn victim, you know, and you go to the ICU and they got that black thing that's adherent to their you know, wound and they have to debride that. Uh, the reason it's black, obviously, their, their, their epidermis is burned and they get inflammation and it forms this sort of adherent crust with epithelium. So this is an eschar. And then why did that happen? So in other words, whenever you get necrosis, you got to say, well, there's, there's a couple of reasons. What are, what's a, the way that the epidermis can become necrotic like this, especially if it's got a basket weave cornified layer to it? Yeah, so um, lots of blood supply. So I yeah, see some good. Thrombi Excellent. up there, yeah. Good, ischemia. So something has just choked this thing off and it happened pretty quickly. So in, in other words, if you see complete, com complete death of the epidermis and it's got a basket we quantify later on, you say, wow, that's an infarct. Something killed that pretty quickly. And that can happen in, in a, a relatively few number of conditions. And then what's going on here? This is important too, because... This can be kind of confusing sometimes. What do you think happened here? Is it reepithelialization? Sure did. This is reepithelial. So this died. This came in and said, "Wow, this you know, we need to put an epidermis over here so the person doesn't lose all their 
you know, fluid and electrolytes here. And so they re pretty quickly. So then let's go down and see if we can see any reason for the ischemia. And wow, what do we have down here? <laughs> yeah, so it's really purple. I thought that was calcium in the Good. vessels. So what's the diagnosis? The calciphylaxis. Good. This is calciphylaxis. And what's going on right here in this blood vessel? Some necrosis of the wall. Yeah, and there's probably some fibrin in there also. So we know that calciphylax is kind of the way that it works is it also is associated with protein C and protein S deficiency, and they actually can get a lot of thrombosis in their blood vessels in addition to the calcification of the, of the walls of the blood vessels. So you don't have to always see this. In fact, sometimes we just had a case the other day um, where there was ischemia in there, epidermis was dead, and we looked very hard and we can only see just a few little tiny spicules of calcium down the subcutaneous fat. Um, so let's look down here. Sometimes that's all you see. This has got quite a bit of it. But when you see it kind of early on, you just may see just little tiny fine granules of calcium um, in the subcutaneous fat or maybe in, in some of the, the capillaries, often in the subcutaneous fat first. I, it seems to like the fat first in the deeper areas. I'm not sure why that is, but that happens quite a bit. And if you get it early, uh, or maybe if you get a, a lesion that's that's kind of laid and a lot of it's kind of re, re uh, uh, sort of modeled, if you will, you may just see very small amounts of calcium. This one's got quite a bit. So this is a nice example of that. And basically, this is a another metabolic disease. So we have pancreatic paniculitis, metabolic process. Well, this is also a metabolic disease that affects the skin secondarily. So this isn't a primary inflammatory process. It's really calcification, thrombosis, secondary infarct, secondary necrosis, and it's pretty much a medical emergency. So if you get this diagnosis, uh, you know, you want to call the clinician and, and tell them that, hey, wow, you know, this guy's got, you know, they're infarcting their skin and they could very well be infarcting their brain and their blood vessels and getting a myocardial infarction. So this is not a good situation. And these people have uh, high calcium phosphorus products. They have high parathyroid disease. They're often associated with uh, kidney disease, as you know. Um, there are some cases that develop in patients that don't have renal disease. Uh, and there actually are now some chronic forms of calciflaxid that don't kill the patient. But when you see this, you know, you need to be, you know, jump on this as, as soon as possible. And here's some examples of the, of the fat degeneration that you can see also. So we saw the fat degeneration from the pancreatic paniculitis. This is fat degeneration because of ischemia here, a different type of, of fat necrosis, fat degeneration. Everybody get this one right, hopefully. Now you can sometimes see calcification of the blood vessels um, in patients that have arteriosclerosis, atherosclerosis in, in older patients that may come in with leg ulcers. Not every case of calcified blood vessels equals uh, calciphylaxis. But if you see small blood vessels like this and you look at the subcutaneous fat and you see that fine stippling of the calcium that, we should, that I showed you earlier, um, that's a huge red flag. Usually don't get the stippling and the fine calcification like that in patients that have atherosclerosis that you know, just have bad blood vessels for years and can gradually get a, a stasis ulcer or whatever associated with that. So if you see this pattern and you get the epidermal necrosis like this, that's a medical emergency basically. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Hi, uh, this is Jamel uh, from UT from the first years. Um, it looks like we have probably like two parts of like a punch. Um, it looks like we're maybe on like the trunk or extremities. Um, doesn't look like a special site. Good. Um, and uh, just at a, at a bird's eye view, I see kind of like almost like a nodule within like the dermis. Um, and it's comprised of um, these structures that are kind of um, elongated. Um, there's some areas that look almost uh, like glands. Um, okay, so you're, say, thinking, you're thinking neoplastic process. Yes, I was okay. yeah, I'm thinking more neoplastic. And then when you see glands, you're obviously thinking of epithelium, right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and as we get closer. You think it's benign or malignant at low magnification? 
I mean, in so I, I was kind of thinking it could even be malignant. Um, there are some places it's not as well demarcated. Yeah, um, and we, it's pretty and what's, large. What's, what's the main problem here? At least applying architectural criteria at low magnification in this specimen. Um, well, you can't see like pleomorphism or. Uh, right, but it, but the architectural pattern. We've obviously got a punch out of something that was bigger, and so yeah. when you get something like that. It just it just points out that you know it can be. You can't always apply architectural features if you've got a punch in the middle of a, a sea of a neoplasm, for example. So um, it does look like maybe it's not super well circumscribed at the edge. But, you know, it's got maybe a couple of different nodules here. So we say, well, you know, maybe it's not so well circumscribed. It looks like it's pretty big. Those might point to malignancy. But we're going to have to look at cytology. So we're going to have to go to higher magnification and see uh, what, whether it's benign or malignant. So sometimes you just have you can't really always apply architectural criteria. Yeah, and as we're kind of scanning through, it's like these very basaloid cells, um, kind of producing these little glandular structures with this, um, some areas are more eosinophilic, um, but deposits within like the, the center. Yeah, there's been, and what about, do, so looking at this power, do you favor benign or malignant now? I, mean, I wanna say uh, malignant, I feel like I see some places that are a little bit more pleomorphic. Yeah, there's a uh, mitotic fever sitting it. here. I yeah. totally agree. These cells are very pleomorphic. Notice the, the variability and the size and the shape of these aggregations. Exactly. Um, and then th this is actually, some of this material in the center is, is almost certainly going to be tumor necrosis. Mm -hmm. So there's some necrotic material of some of the epithelial cells within these individual glands. So those favor malignancy. So can you go any further than that here? Um, I think this is primary to the skin. That's what one thing I was thinking about is because it does go pretty deep. Uh, it could be metastasis. Um, yeah, it could like be maybe a, like yeah, like adenocarcinoma or something that maybe would form like a gland. Good. Yeah. So if you see a malignant gland. You can call it an adenocarcinoma, so that's good. And then you can say, well, okay, adenocarcinoma, is it primary? Like maybe an adnexal adenocarcinoma, like maybe hydradenocarcinoma or, you know, a syringomatous carcinoma, something like that. Or is it metastatic? And, you know, that can sometimes be difficult to discern. Uh, what are some things that you can kind of, can help you between something maybe being primary versus uh, metastatic? like in this field right here, what would favor possibly this being a metastasis versus a primary lesion? Well, it seems to sort of spare like an area between like the, good. the, the neoplasm and like the epidermis. Uh, Excellent, the that's very good. So in other words, if you were to see con contiguity of the epidermis, that tends to favor an a, a epidermal primary process as opposed to a metastatic lesion, not hundred percent. So if you have something like a malignant, you know, spiradenoma, well, that's never gonna be contiguous to the epidermis, for example. So it doesn't always, but it favors it. And so we try to like, you know, we, we hedge our bets. We say, well, based on this, it's more likely to be metastatic than primary. Uh, and it is an adenocarcinoma and it doesn't really look like a classic uh, primary cutaneous entity. It, it, it theoretically could be in a, a primary adnexal carcinoma. And that's one of the things that we sometimes struggle with um, in dermatopathology, not just me, but other dermatopathologists, we sometimes have to deal with that. But there are a couple of other clues that can help you. Um, what are, what's another place you might look to see that might help you, whether it's possibly a metastatic versus a primary process? Maybe like this possibly in that area or here. It's not the world's best, but if this, let's say this is a blood vessel or a lymphatic and you were to see these, these cells within those, that favors a metastasis. Yeah. You know, that, that would favor metastasis. So this is a metastatic adenocarcinoma. So that's good that you were able to suggest that and, and good to pick up on it. Um, I don't think the board is going to ask you uh, really to get into the distinction between which type of cancer is spread to the skin. That's a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, this happened to be breast cancer this time. Um, if you see the, the you know, 
cords and strands of cells, kind of like you see here. Um, that's the so-called politically incorrect Indian filing, I guess. It's what we used to you know, talk about that. That favors uh, breast cancer. So if you see that, just think about if you see these cords and strands between and among collagen bones, that, that tends to favor metastatic breast cancer. If you see a lot of the dirty necrosis with cells that are larger, more cuboidal, and you have some of that dirty necrosis here a little bit, uh, that actually tends to favor uh, a GI or, or colon cancer, that sort of thing. If you see a lot of goblet cells, mucin containing mm -hmm. cells, that tends to favor gastrointestinal origin. So the, the board's probably not going to ask you a lot about the type of different cancers. Just recognize this pattern that you did, that this is more likely to be metastatic. And so the most important teaching point is recognize this adenocarcinoma and the fact that it's not contiguous to the epidermis tends to favor metastasis rather than, uh, than a primary process. Okay. I can go. This is Anna, one of the UT first okay. years. Um, so we have a punch um, and it looks like we have a um, proliferation of some blue appearing cells. Um, it extends pretty deep, like down to the adipose, it looks like. Um, yeah. It's and not so very well. Does that oh, uh, tell you, Roder, you think it's more of an inflammatory or neoplastic process? I think it's more of a neoplastic process. Okay. Um, it doesn't it goes that deep down to the, to the fat like that, would that tend to favor a benign or malignant process? I was favoring a malignant process. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. It goes top to pretty deep and goes side to side. So again, they've punched into probably a much larger lesion. And we can't say, well, this is small. No, it's not small. It's, <laughs> we don't know how big this thing is. It's not very well circumscribed. It goes side to side, top to bottom. So those are like huge red flags that it's malignant, just right off the bat. So I, I, I completely agree with you. So what's our next step that we, we do? Um, would you identify like the cell types? Yeah, the differentiation. Okay. Um, when I was looking at it a little bit closer, some of them looked kind of um, like spindle cells. Um, and then some kind of looked almost like epithelioid. Yeah, um, good. I totally agree with you. I think that you've got some epithelioid appearing cells up here. Uh, some of the cells in some areas, especially down near the bottom, uh, maybe have some sort of a spindle cell like morphology. So I agree with that. Anything else that can help you here? Um, I feel like the arrangement too, like some of them look like they're almost trying to form like vascular structures. Yeah, I would agree with that. And what about that little structure right there? These, these little structures here. What are are you... those like slit-like openings? Yes, or... good, okay. excellent. That's the, the word I wanted you to come up with, with slit-like space. When you see little spaces, slits, um, especially if they're lined by cells, it could possibly be uh, endothelial cells like this, beautiful example of that right there. Then you think vascular. Mm-hmm. So vascular malignant diagnosis is? Um, I was thinking like angiosarcoma. That's angiosarcoma, good. Yeah. So that's, that's it, you're in the category. And for your purposes on the board examination, that's all you need to know. Boom, you're done, so you're right. So this is an angiosarcoma. Now we can, we can learn a few more important things about this slide and some important things from a clinical perspective that are, that are crucial um, in, uh, in dealing with this situation, there are several different subtypes of angiosarcomas. I would not even think about the hemangioendotheliomas for the board purposes for you. So don't even go down that, that pathway. It, it's, it's another type of malignant neoplasm. If you just want to know about the name of it, like Kaposiform hemangioendothelioma is associated with um, Kassebach merit. Okay, so you're never going to have to identify that histologically, but you just should know that that entity is associated with that, and it's a it's a form of angiosarcoma in a way is a way to think about it. But there's a you can get like a very well differentiated angiosarcoma, where the these are the bulk of the type of cells and, and neoplastic uh, vessels that you see, 
And if you just get a punch biopsy of a well differentiated angel sarcoma, it can be subtle and can elude diagnosis. So that's why we don't like the punches of angel sarcomas. This pattern here, which is kind of interesting, is more like the epithelioid type. So notice these cells are cuboidal and they kind of look like an epithelium. You know, that almost looks like a, a breast cancer aggregation there a little bit, right? That just like that yeah. case we just saw. So they can look like an epithelium. It's still angiosarcoma, but it looks like an epithelium. So that's just an epithelium. And then there's a, another type that can be mostly spindle cells. So there's just several, and they can be very poorly differentiated. So there can be a number of different subtypes of angiosarcoma. This is the pattern you really want to look for, these slit-like spaces here. And this very diffuse pattern with these very atypical cells like this, um, this is pretty much classic for angiosarcoma. Now, I don't think they're going to be asking you to distinguish between different types of malignant vascular tumors. I, I don't think they would put this on and then also throw on Kaposi sarcoma. I think they would um, maybe expect you to you know, pick up on this as, as being an angiosarcoma. They probably would show you a, a picture, clinical picture, and then maybe a histologic photomicrograph and say the most likely diagnosis is blank, something like that. I, it, it's sort of, this would be a pretty hard slide for a board examination for a dermatology resident. So I, I don't know that you get this on there. Um, if they did, it would be a really classic pattern. But that's good that you were able to, to diagnose this. And, and it's, it's a dangerous diagnosis. And, and, you know, punch biopsies of these can be problematic. If you do a shave of this, um, I've seen misdiagnoses of these as shave biopsies. Um, I've seen these leads to misdiagnosis of melanoma. They can look like a lot of different things. So just realize they can take on a number of different um, histologic subtypes. And it's a very, very aggressive tumor with a very, very bad prognosis, as, as you guys know. Well, let's end up with this one. It's I'm going to have a cutie case, if you will, and a quickie it's also. Ashley from UT. Um, we have a shave. Um, exciting mix up. Um, and then going, it, we think this is inflammatory because um, we don't really see any good neoplastic areas and there's some um, infiltrate going down um, from the top. It's subtle, isn't it? Yeah, what part of the body do you think you're on here? So I was having trouble with this and I was talking to some of the other people about this. Like I, I, you, I originally was thinking it might be mucosal because I don't really. Yeah, see. you're right. It is mucosal. I'm right. Oh exactly my. Where it is. Okay, perfect. I was like trying to debate: is there like a lot of para, or we just don't have a stratum corneum? This is a clue to mucosal here. If you get glycogen in the epithelium, like here, mm -hmm. that's really almost pathognomonic of mucosal epithelium. You really don't get that in normal, gla you know, glabrous skin. So yeah, that's helpful. And yeah, you notice that there wasn't any hair follicles here. It's kind of got more of a loose myxoid stroma. So this is probably like the mouth or the, you know, maybe the vermilion of the lip or maybe in, just inside the buccal mucosa, something like that. Okay, so now that we know we're in the mouth, we look at the, the dermis and we see this like, you know, amorphous black material as well as some like brown, um, black in the collagen, um, yeah, as well, and then there's some infiltrate um, lymphocytes around. There's a little bit of some lymphocytic infiltrate, yeah, yeah. So this, what's going on here? It's hard to see at high magnification. But look carefully. Do you see those not those little small thin fibers here? Yeah, I see those. And they've got that sort of. If you really were able to go this higher magnification, you see those little tiny brown. Um, dots mm -hmm. that are almost staining those fibers. Yes, I see that. I don't know exactly if that's like a pathognomonic thing, so you'd have to tell me. But, um, but <laughs> well, it's, with, it's helpful. But what's this stuff over here? Is this normal in the skin? It's something exogenous. It is exogenous. Good. Um, so with the mouth in this pigment, maybe more of like a Algamon, am I, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> tattoo. Well, well, maybe you need to spend a little time in, in dental school for a day or something, but yeah, it's an amalgam tattoo. Amalgam, amalgam, amalgam. Okay. And this is before you guys' time, but when I was sitting in a dental chair when I was a kid, getting all my teeth filled, you know, all the candy I was a kid, 
um, they would actually take the silver stuff and they put mercury in there and they kind of mix together and then they they would you know inject this almost in, into your cavity in your tooth and you'd, you'd kind of hear this almost putty kind of stuff getting pressed in there and every now and then they they may actually uh, accidentally miss and, and a little bit gets injected into your subcutaneous well submucosal connective tissue so this is the silver amalgam that gets that got deposited here and then just like you do a silver stain for elastic fibers like a virop and Giesen stain is a silver stain it stains the elastic fibers so this is like an in vivo elastic tissue stain Ooh. and it looks black. And so it looks like a bluish black structure on your skin. So the dermatologist sees patient clinic and, and they say, let's do it a mucosal um, exam. And they open their mouth and lo and behold, they have this black thing say, oh my God, this is going to be, we got to worry about blank. What do we just panic about? When we see something black in the mucous membranes. Uh, melanoma. Yeah. I worry about melanoma. And then they take this biopsy and whew, it's not melanoma. It's an amalgam tattoo. So this was probably somebody that's, you know, an older person when they, they still used to use silver amalgam like me or mercury amalgam. Uh, today, they don't use this anymore. They use porcelain. And so uh, this is a, an older patient and they probably thought this was a melanoma or blue nevus and it's an amalgam tattoo. Now, the most common place we see this today, it's not in the mouth. Where's the most common place we see amalgam tattoos in the 21st century? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you probably do know, but you're just not thinking about it. So um, what, where else does silver and metal get, gets put into people's skin today? Oh, like a piercing? Piercings, yeah. And it's pretty, it's actually fairly common to see, again, a patient may get a piercing when they're younger, they take it out and then maybe they develop a bluish gray kind of structure there. And they say, you know, I, I'm worried about this. Maybe it's cancer. I used to have a piercing here, take a biopsy and it shows the same sort of thing. Usually they don't get as much globular deposits like this. You just seek some staining of the elastic fibers there because some of the silver just kind of leaches out or the, the uh, you know, the, the iron con containing whatever that that piercing structure that was put in some of the metal leaches out and then stains the elastic fiber it just kind of looks more like this you don't usually get these big clumps of the of the silver mercury amalgam like we see over here but that's the most common site that we see uh amalgam tattoos today is from piercing and then of course if you get patients that have argyria and they're taking uh amalgam eye drops or nose drops or drinking silver that you can get on the internet um, they can get a widespread form of Argyria, and then you just see the, the little stained elastic fibers there. So uh, just think they could ask something like this on the exam. You know, they, they would ask you that, you know, some of the metallic foreign bodies. So just make sure you know that as well. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, great. Any questions or anything? Good job. You guys did a great job today and uh, hope it was education for you. You learned something. So uh, we will see you guys next month with another set of interesting cases for you. Thanks, Dr. Pascal. Thank you. Thank you guys.